What up, everybody? Uh, welcome to another episode of Fast and Tirious, where we explore the journeys of scaling HubSpot partners who have run the race and are in the ecosystem today. I am joined today with Idan Carmelli. He's managing partner at Envy. They have been in the ecosystem six years, diamond partner, and something they're very proud of, and they hear it over and over again, is building a exceptional culture. They are a high-end, like, professional firm in Israel. Idan, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me, Matt. Very excited. I love talking to HubSpot partners because everyone's journey is slightly different and there's something to learn from every single one of them and not all of them have the same models. I think that's, it's cool to talk. You know, walk me through is I especially like this understanding this and I often find out things and we've talked before of, that I've never known. Yeah. <laughs> six years, you've been a partner six years. What made I've, you say, yeah, what, what, like what, what made you say, I want to become a HubSpot partner and join this ecosystem. Okay. So I've been a partner six years, Envy, and you're going to hear how they join myself and Envy has been a partner for 10 years. So here's how it went. I've been in the business in the high tech kind of business in the past for, for 24 years. And in the 2000s, for 10 years, for a decade, I worked for enterprise companies. I worked in sales adjacent and marketing positions. And then in 2010, I, for, for some stupid reasons, I decided to, to start my own sort of practice. It was really terribly planned. It was really terribly executed. I just left a very good position I have at a, at a very big company and decided to be a marketing service provider, except I didn't know exactly what. So I tried different things and I worked for the Salesforce consultancy. And one day the owner, a friend of mine, she said, I was in a convention in London and I think what I saw there would be very interesting for you. And then she introduced me to Marketo. That was 2011. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with the concept of a technology built especially for marketers. I had no idea this thing existed. The only thing I ever saw before that related to that was like email marketing software. So mm -hmm. I think 15 years ago, how it was agencies owned the thing completely end to end delivery, execution, all they got was briefs and agencies ran the entire email marketing campaign and they gave back the results to the, to the company. And that's all the touch point that the marketer at the company had with actual running digital marketing to their audience. So seeing a software that gives me the experience of running campaigns, preparing them, running them, and seeing the results directly from my audience was a game changer for me. Huh. So I started in Marketo. I became, I became a Marketo consultant. I implemented Marketo for many companies here in Israel for several years. And over the time, I kept seeing both HubSpot and Pardot, right? They were there. It's mm -hmm. like these were the three main players in a 2010s especially in the early 2010s. So I tried my hand in all of these and I was quite, you know, convinced that Marketo was the, uh, the leading software. And I actually had an opportunity. I implemented HubSpot in 2014, 2015, 2016. I tried and each time I said, no, it's not good enough. It's not good enough. It's Marketo is better. Huh. And then at one point it changed, it flipped. Suddenly, Marketo, I don't know, got stuck in some stasis situation. Their product froze in time somewhere in 2016, 17. And I started realizing that HubSpot is gaining, especially in, a mar in our, our market in Israel, HubSpot is gaining ground. And I, instead of hearing Marketo more, I heard HubSpot and more and more. So I said, I'm missing something. And then I had an opportunity to become a HubSpot partner. That was, I think, 2017, 2018. And I never looked back, man. Never looked back. So that was how I got into it. And then I built a practice around that. And I built an agent, small agency that I was the sole owner of. And in 2020, actually, right before, uh, a little bit before uh, COVID started in 20, the end of 2019, in 2020, it matured. I joined forces and I merged my business, my very small business. I think we were like, 
I have a seven employees, eight employees, and I merged it into Marketing Envy, which was, a, which was another agency in the market, a long time uh, HubSpot partner. We found synergies and we connected and uh, we merged in 2020. So I'm now a managing partner at Envy. Man, that's a, what I love. It says something about you, but it also says something about HubSpot, which is you're constantly evaluating what is the best. And when you see something, you're willing to make a shift to make a change. And I think that's very, just, that's a founder. That's a very special quality because it's easy to, you spent so like Marketo is not easy. That was hundreds of hours learning hundreds. Marketo and you switched it was to fun. HubSpot. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah, you had to give, it's like you had to, it was a divorce. That, that was difficult, but you did it because you saw something and had a hope in something would be better. And number two is HubSpot is last year, they put out 450 plus updates. It is not stalled. I can, we can barely keep up with it. So look, it's a product innovation powerhouse. I have not seen anything like that in B2B software, in SaaS software. They move the fastest. They don't break anything. They rarely break stuff. Things work and you just decide to get on board the, the fast train or drop of it. It's very easy to get on the beta, to drop from the beta, mm -hmm. to, to disable a feature. They're amazing. It works amazingly. Yeah. yeah so like I really pretty, like that about them. Yeah. It's almost like, it's like what you do, it's less, which is, it's just the pivoting in yours. HubSpot's just able to, they were bad. And if you hear Brian Halligan or Darmesh show what they're talking about at the beginning, they were not the best. They were all, they went all in one and they said, but over time, they just never stopped innovating. And now you're capturing mindshare with the CRM, CMS service and marketing automation platform. So it's just incredible. So you're okay. That's how you got started. Now you are at Envy. You are emerging join forces at a diamond, now a diamond partner where, what is your, what is today as a status? is how many employees do you have now and what are your goals or what are goals that you're trying to hit even revenue goals year over year you're trying to hit for next year two or three years what is the, the goal in mind yeah um when we joined i was just so i think in my own practice before i joined with envy so that a little bit like five years ago four and a half years ago i was I made gold to platinum relatively quickly, I think less than a year. And then when I joined with the Envy, I think they were already diamond, but we immediately joined the portals and we became diamond. I'm pretty sure what they were diamond even before that. And we've managed to maintain diamond since then. I think we're going to talk a little bit later also about tiering, I know, and the importance of that. But for me, last year we did, for us last year, I think we made around $3 million in revenue at about 18 FTEs, more or less. And it's been a challenging year because of the overall political situation here and the economical market. There's some, sort of a, like a downturn in our market. We are very much focused on B2B tech. And in Israel, the startup economy makes up a big chunk of B2B tech. So there's a downturn that started in the, in the middle of 2022. And 2023 was a continuation of that. We still did quite well, especially compared to how we thought the year would go. Looking ahead, again, it's still, we're still in a very complicated political and economical situation here in, in our region. So our, our horizon looks beyond 2024. So we hope to, that in the future, we will see a more accelerated growth. Yeah. I, as a point we think about is this, anytime there is a downturn, it's how do you create durable, sustainable systems so that when there is not one, you can outperform those that didn't do well. And it's also an opportunity. So it's really cool that y'all even, but you still were able to achieve sustainability through the time. So when you think about these challenges and you have built your own agency, you've merged and had now you're in a partnership where Correct. you're growing something in, in absolute or something larger, what are, as you think about these tier, like, what are challenges? Say you're talking to somebody that wants to start a partnership. What are three challenges that you face that you would say, Hey, these are things that you will hit. And here's how I recommend you solve them. <laughs> and there's, I know there's a host is you're, as you're building your agency. What are the things that come to mind? 
wait, I, I, I'm gonna, I need to check the list of 200 challenges <laughs> and sort of pick the top three. Look, um, I'm sure you've, you've heard this, but uh, I think the number one challenge was, is profitability. Okay, revenue is nice, tiering is nice, all of that is great. Uh, but in the end, if you make t $10 million, but p profitability sucks and you're, you, you don't, you can't benefit from that. So getting a grasp on profitability and what makes or breaks it in an agency like, like ours was our challenge. And that's one of the things that we solved in 2022 and 2023 that allowed us basically to get through 2023 relatively unscathed. So that was a challenge, especially, and in my business, before I merged, that was a real issue for me. And you know, I think that's true for all. And there's these supply demand. How do you get, how do you have utilization of employees? How did you think through this problem? You're saying, Hey, we think we have solved and we're getting better at solving this. How are you solving it? And why do you think you are better at solving it today? What did the, what did you implement? What frameworks are you thinking through? So the first thing is get a good coach, get a good consultant, business consultant. For us, it's a business consultant that has experience in the HubSpot ecosystem. Um, so that was very important for us. Uh, we are a digital marketing services co uh, agency and also a HubSpot agency, but it's new that if we fix, if we address it uh, in, in, from the lenses of a HubSpot agency, we're going to fix the whole thing. So that, that was key. Second key is getting your metrics, getting your, your making sure that you have the financial data, that you have the operational data. That means getting people in the agency to, to log their hours and you know, all the grunt work that needs to happen that? so that we can measure ourselves and stuff like that. What platform are you using for that? ClickUp. ClickUp. Okay. Yeah. Just, I think it's always cool because you have different, so ClickUp. And then when you talk about measuring, what is your, are you, what is, are you, is that in a Google sheet or are you using Tableau or using Looker? Like what, what are you using to consolidate and use your dashboards from the company? That's a very timely question because we're using Google, Google sheets and uh, I've started now building out our Looker dashboards to, to get even more of it. We're in a good shape now, but you can always improve us techies. We always look for a better dashboard and a better tool. And a better thingy to do that thing that we used to do elsewhere. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of learning there is, is do your best with what, and when you, and then you will learn. And often that's through failure and then do your best with what you know, and just do that over and over again as, as quick as possible. Cause you're talking about profitability as you know, a key metric, especially when you start to scale, cause you want to feed yourself. What is. What is the other challenges? So uh, number two and three, do you hey, hear something when you think about? The other challenge is, I think a key one is, I have two in mind. One is getting the partners to do the strategic work, to focus, you get them as much time. That's a super, super difficult challenge to manage. It's every day is a new day when, you know, when, when it comes to that getting the partners, the senior management to focus on what's strategic, to focus on the future, to focus on finding the past to bring us to the future, as opposed to dealing with the day-to-day -day stuff and the tactical stuff. And that's very challenging. And the more you solve that, it's a paradox because you feel that if you let go of day-to-day -day stuff, then you're not going to get revenue for the next month or you're gonna, your numbers are going to drop. But in reality, you are... you get that from experience running a, a business such as that for, for several years, that when you focus on the strategic level, when you look ahead longer than one quarter and longer than one year ahead, that's when you get true motion and that's mm. when you move the needle and, and it happened to us. So there's the, I've heard this said this way, it's, you can work in the business or you can work on the, and it's real, that transition is painful, but often is what has to occur to scale. Yeah. What was, what was the tactic? What was the framework that really allowed you to hey, lift your head up and feel comfortable working on? What was the thing that you were, what was the aha moment? The aha moment was the realization that we have an extremely talented group of people working with us that have the capability to do more of the things that we used to think that only us can do, only we can do the, the senior managers. 
it's the aha moment comes from when you get the the success of delegation the success of empowerment that you give to people in the organization uh, to do things uh, to do more than just their job description let's say and for us one of one of our special traits as an agency for envy is that we have a very strong people culture we invest a lot we have a dedicated very senior hr director who's been with us for many years and we give we give a lot of attention to that area of the business it has what i just said has multiple implications and multiple manifestations in the day to day life of the agency but the end result here is that the the average quality of the the people in our agency keeps going up and we measure it mm. and it keeps going up consistently so i think when we realize that this is happening and we let that happen we also realize found the ability to start focusing as partners on the strategic stuff so that was very key mm. is a uh, uh, there's common evolutions in, in a, any company one of them and I've heard this said over and over until a coach has told me this is from a coach and it's, it was changed the way I think. And I think it's what exactly what you're saying. It's called the, it's called the Pig, it's called the Pig Melian effect. It is this, it means, okay. It, it is people perform at the level you expect them to perform at. And that relationship is self-fulfilling. And so once you set an expectation for somebody, they will live to that expectation, whether good or bad. So what I'm hearing you say is, hey, I had to let go. That's great. That's great. And I had to say, like hey, it. I expect you to do this and I'm going to give you the space and the autonomy. And if you fail, I'll be there to help you, but I'm going to let you fail. And I expect you not to. And it is, like tra it. It is transform. People rise to expectations. It's transformative. It's so scary. It's so scary because it's like anti-human sometimes because we want to control control and it's very hard to do. And number three, so you have this number one is this supply demand and how it's a, we're a people oriented business and we need to focus on profitability. Number two is give people the space and trust the people you're hiring to make decisions and it'll allow you to work on the business instead of in the business. What's number three? Number three is just have, um, I think it's about having a, a culture of excellence. So it's like a drive. That's more of an int intangible. That's not something you can talk about it and you can say, oh, we have a model of excellence and it's the excellence uh, path that we take or whatever you want to call it. The Kinsey consultants are super good at giving names to that. But at the end of the day, is it's the it's a day-to-day -day practice of giving high-end service, giving high-quality service, getting results, striving towards the results, even when the conditions are not ideal. And when you do it day after day and in, with client after client, that's when it becomes culture. Not when you have a nice slide that talks about it in the sales kickoff. It's when you actually practice that striving to do, to do good at what, to be good at what you do and to make the world feel that, the world being mostly your clients and your employees. I think that's when that, that magic happens. Be because there were times when, you know, when I spoke about a culture of excellence and the culture of excellence was not yet there. So, so what did you do to institutionalize it? What are three, what are two, here's one tactic and here's another tactic on how we created a culture of excellence. Several things. I think one is have identified the, the path to success that happened and try to make that a system, try to processize mm -hmm. that could be like a set of, like what we have now, which is a set of automated or semi-automated processes that we have on ClickUp for onboarding a client, mm. or it could be like sessions, regular sessions that we have where we share ideas and try to cross-pollinate between teams and between clients. Um, but it's anywhere you identify something that worked and you do something to, to float this up and make other aware of it, others aware of it, and hopefully make it a habit. So again, it can be like a template on ClickUp. It can be a slide share, a Google slide kind of template that you share. It can be just a session that you run regularly. Whatever you do, whatever works for you to take something that worked 
and making sure that it's repeated works. That's what we found is I love it. The core. hearing is as companies think and as they continue to scale and grow, you need to focus on profitability, number one. Number two, have expectations that allow others to work in and you to work on. And number three is have a culture of excellence that, in the tactical level and standardize those so that they can occur with reoccurring impact over and over again for both internal and external clients. What is, is anything, uh, just as we coming to the close, there's two questions I like to ask every single time. And I love it. I specifically, what we haven't said yet, and I think is important, even the culture of excellence is, and, and five dysfunctions of a team, this is very important, is you have trust as the, the first layer. The second layer is conflict. Third layer is commitment. Fourth is autonomy. Fifth is results. Is in working with you in the past, having conversations, you are not afraid of conflict. And I think, and there's this like this ability to have crucial conversations and do them well. And I think you do that well. It just hasn't said it here because it's just so a part of who you are. I think it'd be hard for any organization you're not to have that breathe into it. So just as a point, no one, he didn't say it, but I would say my observations. But as we go to those questions is what is, what is one thing you would never do again? Straight up going against a very strong gut feeling, especially one that's shared by colleagues, by, by mm. the other partners. Um, we're at the point where we are all very experienced. We have each of us as many years. I have 24 years. My partner, Billy, has almost the same number and the other two partners also very experienced. It's about time that you learn to trust not just numbers on a screen or a spreadsheet. You have to trust your gut. And especially right in an agency where, you know, saying yes or saying no to the, the right client can have a huge impact. Mm, yeah. So I think um, we almost made a, made a vow to ourselves that the next time, every time, rather every time that we need to make a decision and one of us says, I have a strong feeling that if we take that client, if we take that partnership, if we execute that decision, um, I have a bad feeling about it, or I have a very strong positive feeling about it, we take it into consideration. I know it's not very popular in all our data-centric and measure everything kind of culture. I think it, it's a question of maturity that you need to, you learn to trust again your instincts after they after, failed after you in the past. <laughs> you're like, your instincts are ripped out and then you learn to trust them again. Peter, I think somebody says very interesting. And this is actually from Brian Halligan and Darmesh when they were creating, when they were creating HubSpot, it's called the power of the contrarian. And it's from Peter Thiel, which you can argue with his, some of his social or political views, but like here is, it's called the power of the contrarian. And that is. In order to win sustainably, you must be right about something that everyone else thinks you're wrong about for a long time. And which means, what does it actually mean? People will call you stupid. They're going to call you crazy. And you just have to, you have to do it anyway. And you can only choose one or two of those, but that's like fundamentally it. what a secret is. I like it is. a lot. Yeah. Like yeah. It so it's just like there, this gut, what, that, what he's really saying is you have a gut instinct that may not be built on data and you do it anyway. HubSpot did that. They went to SMB first. Like they did mm. that. Like it's called, it's like when everybody else zigs, I zag. And uh, it's just understanding what's your zag. So if you're saying, what's your zag? I think the second time they did that is when they decided to go head to head with Salesforce. Yes. Yeah, that was exactly. They said, don't do it. Don't go, do not build CRM. It's big blue. You're going to lose. They did it anyway. Uh, um, exactly. Exactly. What's the one, what's that for you, by the way? Oh gosh, I, I just wrote these down actually because I, I was like thinking through them. My, my number one is when I back when I was doing Rev Partners was starting was like I said, hey, HubSpot is a enterprise CRM. My my, my ever I was in the Salesforce ecosystem. I accidentally found a HubSpot. I was trying to get somebody off of HubSpot <laughs> because it's because it was a it was made by marketers. I, I I had to use it and in using it, getting ready to take it off. I went, holy crap, this is better than Salesforce. Oh, wow. And I was, I was like, and that was like, I was like, and I went HubSpot and never looked back. It's, that's number one. But number two is, and you're about to see it is, I think every, the way we learn at work is completely and utterly broken. What I mean that is we have this, think of HubSpot certifications. Think of and the academy. Think of people build their own LMSs inside to teach you a software over and over again. And that's not the best way to learn. You learn in app 
and no app is only in Correct. one applications. They're always cross app. So I'm like, hey, I think LMSs are broken and we're going and we're creating something that allows you to have cross app in app guided tours. And brilliant. And we're gonna just gonna re rethink LMSs altogether. But yeah, so there's one there's a zag that's gonna happen. And we think it should we, we, we don't want to own people inside our platform and it's gonna be in the Chrome extension, right? We actually live in someone else's platform. So it's the zagging. Brilliant, brilliant. What was the other one? Uh, the next question, uh, what would you do earlier? Oh, easy. I would have gone all in on HubSpot earlier than I did. Because what got me about HubSpot is not the software because six, seven years ago, it's not, it wasn't the same software that it is today. Yep. What got me was how they treated partners, was how they, um, they perceived partners to be such an integral part of their own go-to market and their own future success. And they, and once I realized it and I could have realized it earlier and I didn't, and that's the thing I regret that I could have done it earlier because I can tell you, man, the other, the other vendors I mentioned, that's where they failed. That's where they failed. They failed in, in realizing that your partner ecosystem is everything and, and it's more important than your direct approach because it's has much more feet on the ground. It's more grounded. It's more embedded in the market, especially when you go global. And, and I wish I would have realized that earlier, but it's also looking ahead. I wish that HubSpot keep that realization as a light post as a, as a very clear guiding light ahead. So I wish they keep that because that's very powerful. Agree. I think that'd be a bad thing. HubSpot says that 90% of all their net new acquisitions, their goal is to have a partner attach rate to them. I do think they are th rethinking what type of partners they want. I do not think their commitment to partners has changed. But I do think they're uh, saying, hey, I want you to sell and be and organize a bit differently. And because they're moving from marketing solely to more integration types. Idan, thank you for the time. Anybody wants to, uh, you're you have a lot more knowledge to give than the amount of time we have here. If somebody wants to come and talk to you after today, where would they find you? Go Envy. That's our website with we tons of content there and resources and other videos where you, for whatever reason, maybe want to see me talking about other stuff, but mostly better resources than that. So go envy.io and on LinkedIn, of course, Envy. Yeah, that's it. It was a pleasure. Appreciate you. Thank you for dropping by Pit Stop in a way at uh, Fast and Tyrius. Thank you, Don, for coming. Thank you. Hey, everybody, stay awesome. Keep doing it big and stay super. Adios, everybody.